rushing of past events that people have decided to agree upon. Napoleon Bonaparte once famously said. Mark Twain, an American writer, also said that the very ink with which history is written is merely fluid prejudice. In other words, there are many sides to a story. History is debatable. It is open to interpretation. It is all too frequently written by the winners, those in power, those who actually have the means to relay the version of a series of events. Even our own personal history actually lies in the eyes of the beholder. Now, how many times have any one of you and your siblings or lifelong friends disagreed about some certain events of your childhood? From the name of your first pet, to quibble about who was mom's or dad's favorite. Now, doing such quibble, wouldn't it be right if you actually have a time machine and go back to actually find out what happened? That's the importance of history. Now, I want you all of you to actually pay attention to the concentric circles of history and the way it actually shapes the licensed history and the silenced history. At the end of the TEDx talk today by 3 p.m., whatever is happening now will actually be classified as history. The first circle, everything that ever happened. The second circle, everything that was ever seen. It's not everything happening now that we're actually seeing. And even what we're seeing, there's a high probability that we're actually seeing it differently. The top circle. Everything is someone recorded. Now, it's not everything we're actually seeing we're recording. We're probably recording important points or things that actually appeal to our mind and senses. The fourth circle. Every record has survived. Now, there's no assurance or guarantee that whatever record we actually have today will survive. We might probably lose some of those records, either through because of natural disasters or other unforeseen events. The next circle, everything that we found. Now, it's not all the records that survive that are found. There's so many records out there. They survived. But we need to find them. And in the last circle, everything that people, everything we've decided to agree upon. Now, it's not everything that we've actually found that is documented as history. People still have to decide or agree upon what should be documented as history and what should not be documented as history. Now, whatever people decide or agree upon to be documented as history is the licensed history. Is the history that actually makes it to the archives? Is the history that makes it to the museums? Is the history that actually makes it to the monuments? Is the history that actually makes it to our textbooks? And whatever we've actually found and has been left undocumented is the silenced history. Is the history that is not talked about? Is the history that actually makes it to the archives? Is the history that actually hardly makes it to the museums, to the monuments, or even our textbooks? Whatever people decide or agree upon to be documented as history actually shape our identity. It helps us to understand change and how the society we live in came to be. It actually provides us with collective memories. It tells us who we are, why we are, the way we are. But the question is, what are people deciding or agreeing upon what should be documented as history? And how exactly are we sure that what has been agreed upon to be documented as history actually reflects the accurate truth? Now, if you actually ask anyone in 1865, 
Why was the civil war fought? You probably get a different answer from a northern, to a southern, to an African American, and even an American Indian. You will get different answers from them. For the Jews, all the Jews actually stood for suffering, individual deaths, and collective annihilation. For the Germans, all the Jews actually stood for the difficult parts towards individual rebirth and the collective resurrection of the purified German nation. For most Americans, and this actually came as a shock to me during the last Thanksgiving Day, when I saw the video where I took the snapshots breaking the Thanksgiving meat. For most Americans, Thanksgiving Day is actually a mem is one of the memorable holidays where families actually gather together to, to feast and to be thankful. But for Native Americans, Thanksgiving Day is actually a day of mourning. So if there's no one single authoritative account of the past, then the question is, whose version of history is right? Whose version of history is actually licensed and documented? And whose version of history is silenced and undocumented? And how does this process of deciding or agreeing upon what should be documented as history, how does it actually shape the construction of social identity and the power of memory culture? Now, I want all of you to actually take a minute and actually imagine a situation. And this was the way I actually felt back in Nigeria and even when I went to England while I was studying about Nigerian history. Now, I want all of you to actually take a minute and actually think. Imagine a situation where what you're actually being taught by your parents is your history is in conflict with what you're reading from your textbooks or what your professors are actually teaching you. Now, what would you do in such a situation? Would you walk up to your professor and submit an objection? And tell your professor the story, what you're teaching is completely different from what I've been told. Or will you challenge the representation of your professor with the received accounts of your parents? But the question is, how are you sure this version of history is right? Is it a version of your parents? Or the version you're actually reading from textbooks? Now this actually brings me to the role of textbooks as a contested site of negotiation between the silenced and licensed history. Now as professors, students, academics, professionals, one of the ways we can actually contribute to the vigorous public debate about the meaning of the past is for us to actually develop a critical mindset, critical inquiry, and critical engagement with history textbooks for us to actually ask questions, no matter how, how uncomfortable those questions are, and for us to actually make attempts to know the many sides of a story. Now, if licensed history, the history that is actually documented, the licensed history, if licensed history is the history of the victors, the history of those who actually decided or agreed upon what should be documented as history. If this is the meaning of licensed history, then why is it important for us to speak about the history that actually found but left undocumented, the silenced history? Why is it important for us to speak about the silenced history? What had the importance? Well, it is important for us to actually speak about silenced history in order to create truthful dialogue that encourages action to redress the history of inequity and to create awareness of historical injustice. In other words, to actually foster the culture of public apology. Now, some of you might actually wonder, public apology? Why? The culture of public apology actually helps to restore a moral balance. It helps so uh, it helps to ensure the acknowledgement of a wrong and the harm it has caused, and a commitment to the non-repetition of the wrong. And there's so many examples of this culture of apology. For example, 
the Canadian government's offer of reconciliation to the 1.3 million indigenous people who were actually subjected to forcible relocation and other injustice. The France, the French government's apology for the massacre of thousands of Algerians in 1945. The Pope's apology for the 2,000 years anti-Semitism preached by the church. And in Australia, a National Sorry Day was actually established in 1998 to commemorate the ill treatment of the Aboriginal people. Now, some of you may actually wonder, well, what has this culture of public apology actually achieved so far? Well, the public culture of public apology actually evolved because of the discussion and conversation about silenced history. Because of the conversation and discussion about the history that actually found but left undocumented. And do you know what? This culture of public apology is actually laying the foundation for the healing of historical memory, for the healing of people who actually felt suppressed, whose voice who were actually voiceless and felt suppressed. Because what has been accepted and documented as history is in conflict with what they, are, with what they know and their own experience. Now, speaking about memory, as an African reading, when I said my reading of American history, I was particularly enthused by the celebration of the Black History Month. Well, February is not just famous because it's the month of Valentine's Day, but in America, it's also famous because it symbolizes the celebration of Black History Month. Now, one of the questions I ask myself is, why Black History Month? Why do you have to actually set a specific month for the celebration of Black History? Why don't we have other race having their own history? Why don't we have July as Asian history? Or one of the reasons why we actually have Black History Month is because of the silenced history. It's because the world actually offers African Americans, it offers Af the voices of Af African Americans to be heard. It offers the voices of African Americans that were actually found, their experiences. But some, most of those experiences were actually left untold. They were left undocumented. Most of those experiences did not make it to the archives. They did not make it to the museums, or neither did they make it to the monuments, or neither do we even read them in textbooks. So the celebration of Black History Month actually gives the opportunity for African Americans to actually reflect, to reconstruct their identity, and to also see that what the society is telling them, the stereotype, is not necessarily what the history has been to show the history of resilience, to show the history of people who actually contributed to this great nation, America, or who, whose voices have actually not been told. Now, one of the things we should actually prepare for in the future is the fact that the more conversation we have about silence history, the more people get interested about the histories that are actually found but left undocumented, the more we will actually be compelled to go back and reflect on the interpretation of the past that has been codified so far. So the future may actually be a competition between licensed history and silenced history. And this will actually give us the true meaning of history, which is the fact that for every history, there are actually many sides of a story. Thank you.